So I've been singing the praises of Kingdom Hearts the first since, I want to say, 1996. I know the game didn't come out until 2002, but I just knew somehow. I, I felt it in my little baby bones. Your first words were Mama, mine were, you know, Mom, I think you're underselling Monstro. After all, it's the site of Riku's moral event horizon. It was a long crawl back from the fire station that night. I talk a lot of talk about KH1, but can I walk a lot of walk about it? That's a first draft sentence that I'm keeping in. Outside of the occasional bout of burger arranging, I've never been much for speedrunning. I'm more of a stop and smell the roses guy, which has really upset the beast on my KH2 playthroughs. Apparently you're not supposed to remove the glass or whatever. Now, while I don't think speedrunning a game automatically makes you an unquestionable authority on it, I always thought being semi-competent at a KH1 speedrun would be a nice notch on my very Nemurian belt. At the very least, if I ever need to get footage of something for a video, I'll be able to get where I need to go much quicker. I'm streamlining the process, and when the video itself is about getting places quicker to more easily get footage, well, it doesn't get much streamlinier than that. My first attempt at a KH1 speedrun was in October of 2021. It was my 25th birthday, and I was fairly intoxicated. My beard was big and gross, but only as a prank, on myself. If you could believe it, the run wasn't very good. I was faster than three other people, and it landed at like 92nd place on the leaderboard. I pleaded with the moderators to create a sloppy drunk birthday any percent category, and they told me to kick rocks. I tried to run it again about a week later, entirely sober, and I did much worse. So that was a tough elixir to swallow. I didn't even upload the bot of it. After that, I stopped trying for nearly two years because it really was something of a self-own. But fast forward a bit to August of 2023, I was ready to get back up on my horse, or proverbial Hydra's back. Last time I ran the game on PC, this time I tried my hand on PS5. Why is that, because there's time saves on console? No, quite the opposite. My Epic Games copy just didn't feel like launching for a while, so thanks Epic. But I would be sticking to beginner any percent, meaning I'd play on the easiest difficulty with the goal of reaching the game's credits as quickly as possible. At first, it was just my intention to get a PB, to beat my old time, despite now being on a different leaderboard. It turns out, with a bit of preparation and forethought, it's quite easy to beat a drunkenly obtained time of 3 hours and 32 minutes. In fact, that happened on my first try on PS5. So I moved the goalpost to getting a run of sub-3 hours, and eventually I established a long-term goal of breaking into the top 100 on the category's leaderboard. I was near the bottom of the PC leaderboard with 92nd, but there's nearly 250 runs on PS4 and 5. Top 100 seemed feasible, but was still a bit far off for me. Spoilers, I eventually succeeded, but this video is actually a call to action. I want to share my speedrunning journey with you because I want you to beat me and push me back out of the top 100 so I have a reason to go back and keep playing and improving my time. I could just make a new goal, top 75, top 50, but I do feel like it would be a bigger time commitment than I can afford right now, and I'm not actually confident in my abilities to get there without grinding the category for a good while. But I'm here to say that I honestly think getting top 100 in this category isn't really that hard. It's not easy, it's not going to happen on your first try, but you might be surprised how attainable it can be. Toward the end of my goal, I started practicing a few trickier segments for sure, but never for more than an hour or so at a time. I picked the game back up on August 2nd, and I reached 89th on the leaderboard on September 8th. It also wasn't even the only thing I was doing, I was still working on videos and keeping my normal Twitch schedule in addition to the speedrun attempts. All this to say, I think if you enjoy and are familiar with KH1, this is something you can achieve fairly painlessly, so I encourage you to give it a try if you're even slightly interested. I guess you could consider this video both documentation of my journey, but also an amateur's guide for fellow amateurs, bearing in mind that this amateur tried to implement strategies that he picked up from watching much better runners. A ton of people did the labbing and legwork for me, I'm sort of just like a sloppy cover artist trying my hand at imitation. That is to say, I am in no way claiming that I came up with literally anything that I talk about here, nor am I even advising that what I do is the best theoretical method, it's just what I've cobbled together to get me as far as I've gotten. When I started studying and practicing parts of the run, I tended to watch a run by Kaiblade, who has the highest placement in the category using the North American version of the game. And as for the history behind all of the tricks and time saves, there's a great video by Saiyans that details the world record progression for the game. I'll link both videos in the description. Immediately upon starting a speedrun journey on PS5, it quickly becomes obvious why PC is a better option, and that's the intro. I love simple and clean as much as the next guy, but it's an unskippable monster on console. I don't care about the time counting toward the run, I care about getting right back into things after a reset, and Utada makes that very difficult. There are so many things that can go wrong in Dive to the Heart and Destiny Islands, and the penalty for restarting a run is a nearly three and a half minute slap on the wrist. And things will go wrong in these early portions. The shadows on the platforms, for instance. I still don't know how to deal with them. I have no doubt that there's a strat here, but I almost always feel like I'm at the AI's mercy. 
Sometimes you can get them all clumped up and hit them all at once, and sometimes you'll at best kill them one at a time, or at worst whiff and or knock them far away with your finisher. Early on, it's easy to shrug these off, but once I was in the teens and twenties of my attempts, it became hard to press on after a bad start. It also doesn't help that the first boss of the game is a massive roadblock. Of course, I'm referring to this fucking barrel on the third platform. I'm sure this is just a me thing, but this barrel kicks my ass every time. You probably know that aerial combos are quicker to pull off than grounded combos, even casually this is a pretty commonly employed strat. Naturally, in a perfect world, air comboing this barrel to move on to the next part of the tutorial would be a bit of a time save, but I cannot, for the life of me, do this consistently. Every time, Sora ends up landing on the barrel and doing this awkward little dance, and I eventually have to ground combo the thing anyway. I think I have to reset again. Of course, I can load up a save on Destiny Islands and practice on the barrel on the seashore, and I can do it five times in a row. But as soon as it's a real attempt, I choke. So it goes to show that the nerves are real, even if you're literally only five minutes into the run. Sometimes, if I'm feeling really disgusting, I'll even land on the giant crate as well, just for fun. That was a little thing I did. See, I'm closer to the door now. See that little thing that I did? But once I make it through the great wooden filter, we move on to Destiny Islands. And this world features one of my favorite little tricks in the game, even though it also involves a barrel and I eat shit when attempting it about 20% of the time. But cutting down on the time it takes to climb up to the cloth by throwing this barrel and then grabbing these ledges is just immaculate. It's not as hard as it looks, but sometimes I don't throw the barrel correctly and then the whole thing is shot. Collecting the rest of the supplies is pretty straightforward, for the most part. The seagull egg is something that's easy to mess up if you panic, but you just need to climb the skinny tree and then very calmly jump backwards onto the bigger one. Unfortunately, this is then followed by coconuts, which have definitely been the source of a good few resets for me, and I'm sure hundreds of others. I did pick up on this trick of hitting one tree on your way down from the seagull egg on the off chance that you get a yellow coconut, but it never happened during any of my PBs. As far as I know, all you can really do is smack the trees and pray. You have to pace out your swings though, because if you hit too quickly, you can risk despawning a yellow coconut and replacing it with a brown one, and there's pretty much no worse feeling on this earth. Ooh, okay. No! No! How could this happen to me? Beyond that, there's nothing too crazy about Destiny Islands. Obviously, there's a lot you can do to make your movement and combat more precise, but I figure that kind of goes without saying. I mainly want to point out some more major time saves that I started adding into my runs, or things that you might not think to do on a casual playthrough. One of those things includes when you first arrive in Traverse Town. Your natural inclination, and the game's prodding, would steer you toward the accessory shop. However, just heading straight for the second district saves you a trip in and out of the shop. If you didn't know, all you need to do to move the plot along is kill five shadows, and those can be in the second district, or in the first when you go back in, or a mixture of the two. Another thing I learned, after the scene where Sora first meets Sid, you don't need to talk to him again afterwards to trigger the Leon fight. Telling him that you've had no luck finding your friends is an indicator that Leon will now appear outside, but whether or not you read it has no bearing on moving things along, so that saved me some time once I realized. After guard armor is where the dreaded act of menuing rears its ugly head. Up to this point in the run, all you have to do is inject yourself with the mountain of steroids in your pockets during Sora's dream, which is pretty easy to do. But now we're getting into make or break territory when it comes to item management, as you'll want to have the right stats and eventually money to help the run go as smoothly and quickly as possible. This is typically where I start consulting a menu guide on my other monitor, and while it can feel painfully slow to follow the instructions of a guide during a live run, on earlier attempts it definitely saves you time in the long run, because fumbling here can have disastrous consequences later. And it has for me. I used a guide put together by Violin, who's the current world record holder. I actually made a copy of it and added in some images and highlighted each section in a different color to help my brain keep track of when and where everything happens. I think the menu guide alone was responsible for shaving half an hour off my drunk time, because having your Sora properly equipped goes a long way in getting things to die faster. Once the post-guard armor menuing is done, I guess there's two routes you can take. You can continue on to Wonderland, or you can do the Red Trinity glitch to access the secret waterway ahead of time, followed by meeting Merlin. I'm actually not sure if it's faster to just do things normally, but I like to use the glitch. Since no Heartless spawn after guard armor until you leave town, this makes for a peaceful jog through the alley and no prismals to bother you when trying to activate the trinity. Regardless, if you don't do the glitch now, you'll have to do the red trinity the intended way later on after Deep Jungle. But no matter what you choose to do, when you first access the world map, you have to edit your gummy ship. And if there's one thing scarier than that dream barrel, it's the gummy menu. All you need to do is delete all your gummies and then install a cockpit, cannon, and engine, save the blueprint, and exit back to the map. It sounds easy enough, and in actuality it is, but the fear of messing things up and the somewhat unintuitive control scheme for the gummy garage can make this a really awkward segment on early attempts. You might be wondering why we're flying an essentially naked gummy ship, and that's because being nude makes you more aerodynamic. 
Your ship is literally pulled through the routes faster when there's less of it, hence the three-block ship we're electing to fly. Thankfully, the gummy routes serve as a good break to read chat and do ill-conceived impressions. Next, we arrive at Wonderland, which loves to break my heart. If I had clubs, spades, and diamonds as organs, it would love to break those too. I can very rarely get a Wonderland to go completely right, and it's usually entirely my fault. The first tricky bit is getting through this first batch of mobs in the Lotus Forest, and then carefully hugging the wall into this nook here and grabbing the evidence box. If I'm too sloppy, I get the next wave to spawn, which is bad since you can't open things with a red command menu. Then there's Crank Tower, before which I will always manage to unleash one or both of Donald and Goofy from the box I poorly select. This is obviously undesirable because you'll want to have more targets for the annoying card soldiers to focus on. The tower is also really allergic to lock-on in my experience, which slows me down quite often. After that, it's a beeline to the Tea Party Garden and the flipped Bazaar Room, which has some important movement for enemy-avoiding purposes. Initially, I'd climb up onto the stove and jump onto the first table to avoid mob spawns, but I later learned you can just stay on the slope and avoid them just the same. After lighting the two lamps, it is crucial to make a good jump toward the latch so you can shortcut back to the Queen's Castle before the mobs spawn in. Once again, a red command menu renders the latch inoperable, meaning you either need to clear the mobs or take the long way back through the forest, neither of which are good. I mess this up more often than I should, and it's a massive pain in the ass. Finally, there's Trickmaster, assuming you're able to pull yourself up onto the table without throwing your controller. If the fight goes well, you should never have to climb onto the table again, as you can jump off, wail on him, and then keep smacking him at the height of your jump with one or two hits. If the fight goes really well, he never starts walking around before dying. With that, we move on to Deep Jungle, which really ramps things up as far as little tricks and exploits go. A crucial part of this world is something I use even when playing the game more casually, and that's making sure to grab the save point in the tunnel area before jumping into the big tree hole. It's less about saving our game, and more about saving time in this case, and saving us from classic Deep Jungle platforming. Of course, and this is also something I use when playing casually, but you don't have to actually do the jungle slider minigame here, you can just quit and get spit out at the camp. And now it's time to collect the slides. Watching higher level runs, the movement here can be insanely smooth, and I'm pretty touch and go as to whether or not I attempt to imitate that on my runs. You can cancel out some lag and optimize the time spent with the info box on screen by swinging your keyblade or dodge rolling at the right time, but I couldn't really explain the best way to do that. I just sort of wing it, and sometimes it looks good, and other times it looks like dog shit. After Jane's power point, we have to go meet Kerchak, and that's where the save point comes in. Instead of going through Hippo's Lagoon and climbing there, we can use the save point to back out to the gummy ship and then re-enter the world at the tunnel, putting us much closer to the next cutscene. Up here is a spot where I started trying to incorporate a trick in my later runs, which involves casting fire when falling through any sort of small enclosed space. Being in this animation while passing through these spaces keeps Sora from grabbing the ledge and thus wasting time. It's not a make or break thing, but something I tried to use more frequently, and it sees some use again with the hatches in Neverland. After progressing the plot a bit, our next big hurdle is the Power Wild fights, which are, from what I can glean, fairly notorious thanks to their somewhat random nature. The monkeys are incredibly slippery and seem to find profound joy in making your splits turn red. The common tactic here is to try and group the monkeys up and hit them with blizzards, which is the go-to crowd control spell. For me, these fights essentially boil down to spray and pray and popping an ether when my MP gets low. Once again, the save point can be used after fighting the camp power wilds to warp up to the tunnel and then go in the order of climbing trees, treehouse, then jumping off to the right to reach the cliff, the bamboo thicket, and looping back into the camp. The most interesting thing I learned during this segment is some cool movement used to access the second floor of the treehouse, which is quicker than walking around and jumping through a first floor window. You just have to walk up this part of the tree and then you can grab onto the outer edge. It's a bit finicky, but it's actually a lot easier than it looks. There's also a quicker method for leaving the treehouse, which involves jumping on these boxes and then over the railing to more quickly reach the cliff loading zone. The Sabor fight is next, and I don't know, I just hit buttons. Obviously you don't want her to jump into the thicket, and a better player can prevent her from doing that. Up next, I couldn't believe it took me 21 years to learn this, but you don't need to go back to the tent to have Tarzan confirm that Jane is in trouble. You can just run right through the camp, jumping over these boxes, and continue on to Hippo's Lagoon. You might be wondering why you don't use the save point trick again to go back to climbing trees faster, and that's because the game fucking blocks off the loading zone from the tunnel room if you try this. So we have to take the long route, but not too long. What I learned in Deep Jungle is that quitting is for winners, because you can once again activate a minigame and then promptly quit to be placed closer to your destination. In this case, activating the flower for the critically acclaimed Vines minigame will put you right next to the loading zone for the climbing trees area upon quitting. Thanks, Mother Nature. After that, we get to fight our best, most special boy. I don't really have any strat for him beyond sticking to two-hit combos as to not knock him too far away and give him the chance to recover or jump around. I especially tried to keep him close to the bamboo thicket entrance so he's further away from any funky terrain that can get in the way between my keyblade and his face. 
Then it's time for Waterfall Cavern, which, fuck this place. This is the part where people in chat go, hmm, I guess platforming in KH games isn't so good after all, is it, Pat? And it's like, no, that's not how this works. I like platforming when I'm not dead set on getting through an area as quickly as possible. I like eating fruity pebbles, but if every time I poured myself a bowl, Fred Flintstone jumped out of the box and started punching me in the balls, then yeah, I'd be a bit stressed out and maybe vocally express my frustration sometimes. I'd still enjoy fruity pebbles, but I don't think I'm in the wrong or a hypocrite to be a bit annoyed by this added variable. All this to say, fumbling a jump or ledge grab here feels like being punched in the balls by a cereal mascot. I'm still not good at this part, and I never will be. From here, it's the biggest amount of downtime in the run, at least relative to the rest of it, which is a long flight back to Traverse Town, followed by Sid giving you what feels like his entire life story. What's coming next is really a gate that keeps out the unprepared player. If your finances are not in order by your return trip to Traverse Town, that is very bad news. Upon Sid finishing his soliloquy, you need to sell everything you have besides your elixirs and the white fang accessory. If you don't have at least 1,250 money, you're more boned than the Pumpkin King. I mean, hypothetically, you could scrounge up money by selling some gummy blocks later, but that still might not be enough to push you over the threshold if you haven't been violent enough in your travels. I've screwed up several times by either failing to collect enough money from enemies up to this point, or not having the right accessories equipped and thus not selling the correct equipment. The reason we need this money, for the record, is so we can meet Sid at his real job and buy both a new engine gummy and a haste gummy, which cuts down on our gummy travel time for the rest of the run. Once Sid is done yapping and we've nearly emptied our pockets, I use the save point to warp over to Merlin's place, though if you didn't use the glitch earlier, you'd have to go there the long way and do the Red Trinity now. After chatting with the old coot, we hop over to the 3rd district, skip the Riku scene, and very importantly, unlock the shortcut back to the 1st district while there are no mobs. You do not want to leave the small house and then be trapped in the 3rd district with Heartless, which may or may not have happened to me. Oh, I gotta unlock this. Fuck, I never did that. Then, after shopping with Sid and not having an emotional breakdown because you don't have enough money for Chicken Nugget, we set course for Agrabah. And that's a lie. You first have to remember to actually equip the shit you just bought on your gummy ship. Imagine buying stuff that makes your ship go super fast and then throwing all of that stuff into the trunk and flying away very slowly. Couldn't be me. I forgot to equip it. <laughs> I forgot to equip it though. I was so excited that I got it, I forgot to equip it. Fuck me. Once you're actually set up, it's apparently faster to warp to Wonderland and then fly to the warp hole from there, as going straight from Traverse Town actually loses you time. At this point in the run, my condition of having the attention span of a peanut M&M really starts to hurt me, as I will constantly forget that I can now press the boost button to go faster. If you do set out on your own speedrun journey, be better than me and just mash the boost button for the entire flight. For the record, while most conventional playthroughs would probably take care of Opposite Armor before leaving Traverse Town, if you weren't aware, you can save him for way later in the game. For speedrunning purposes, it makes sense that he's saved until after Neverland, since you have to come back to town before Hollow Bastion anyway, and you'll be stronger and able to kill him more quickly by then. So after our first hasted flight, we land in Agrabah, and I don't know how other runners feel about this world, but there's no world I'd rather skip. Maybe if I were more skilled and ran this more, I'd change my tune to something else, but for now, this is my hell. I want to desert the desert as soon as I arrive. I will make mistakes here and think about them for the rest of the run, trying to get the sand out of my ears over an hour later. Agrabah is not governed by the Sultan, it's governed by Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong, will go wrong. Things are fairly manageable for the first portion, with another crucial case of grabbing a save point, this time in Aladdin's house, which is super helpful for later. The bandits in the desert tend to go better than Power Wilds as far as mob battles go, I just spam Blizzard and hope for the best. Upon returning to the city, my first few runs would attempt to actually weave through the streets to make it back to Aladdin's house, which is a total waste of time. I threw myself at this one mini keyhole in the alleyway over and over, trying to unlock it before mobs could spawn. Alternatively, you can go into this closet, use the save point there, and warp over to the one in Aladdin's house that we grabbed earlier. One of the, frankly, dumber oversights in my earlier attempts. There is some more menuing done here in Aladdin's house, which I won't really reference too much moving forward unless I find it particularly interesting, but rest assured it's important every time it comes up. Next is a moment that's basically up to chance, and that's entering the bazaar, which holds another mini keyhole. Unlike the alleyway, this one absolutely must be unlocked to progress to the pot centipede fight. What sucks about the bazaar is that it has a chance of spawning the black fungus heartless, which take longer to kill than the standard batch, so you're best off just leaving and coming back until you get normal mobs. Of course, the normal mobs are no picnic either, featuring some bandits and green requiems that'll inevitably fling themselves out of reach or float above the center pit. You want to avoid that center pit because there's more spawns down there, so it's just a super annoying and stressful process of taking them out on this starting ledge. If it gets really bad, I'll take out one or two Heartless, and then leave and come back so the survivor's positions can be reset. 
The pot centipede fight that follows isn't awful, but it isn't great. I have no idea how he works, and it seems like he'll randomly choose which direction he wants to run in. Usually that's not a big deal, but for our purposes, it's preferable that the fight ends as close to the plaza as possible, as that's where we're headed after we kill it. Something I found interesting about this fight is that you can sometimes kill the pot centipede in one portion of the city, but have enough time to run past that room's loading zone and thus be closer to the desert after skipping the post-boss cutscene. For example, on several occasions I've killed him in the main street area, but since the fight makes the city one big area with no loading zones, I can run under this arch into the plaza area and resume control from there. It's small tricks like these in the run that I found especially fascinating and fun to learn. And I hate everything left in this godforsaken place. Somehow the cave is the fight I dread the least here, whereas on a level 1 run, it's one of the worst fights in the game. The only thing of note that I can really point out here is that I try to get up on the cave's head right at the start of the fight, which has mixed results. Oh fuck. Alright, we got it, we got it. No, no, let me back up! Let me back up! For Christ's sake, let me back once I get on, I can usually avoid falling off, but it really hurts to nearly make it onto this fuck snow only for him to shake you off at the last second. And then you're stuck waiting until he starts violating the sand so you can more easily jump on. Thankfully, years of playing the game casually makes the cave interior pretty painless for me to navigate, but then it's just a one-two punch of bullshit. Jafar is honestly the reason I'm not incredibly eager to continue running the game. And in the grand scheme of things, it's really not a run killer if things go wrong here, especially at my level, but it just feels like absolute rotten ass when it does. There's a way to end this fight really quickly, it's what the big boys and girls call One Cycle Jafar, and this is like, a false promise for me. It's sort of like the dive to the heart barrel if it were a flying dickheaded vizier. I have managed to kill Jafar on this first platform dozens of times, but only ever in practice and never when I'm actually running. More experienced players could probably clearly lay out what needs to be done here, but I lack the language and retention. Time and time again, I would think I figured out the secret ingredient, replicate it a few times in a row, and then be unable to come close the next 20 tries. You have to, like, hit him a specific number of times, but you have to space those hits out, and you want to sprinkle in some blizzards while also mashing triangle to get Aladdin aggroed on him, but you also need to make sure you're hitting him from the right angle, and I just think this will always be a barrier for me. I don't have the patience or willpower for things like this. And don't get me wrong, it is pure euphoria when you can deplete that HP bar before he ever starts flying around, but the more likely scenario is that you crack under pressure and the fight quickly devolves into a game of cat and floating wizard man. And this is why I find the fight so demoralizing, because I always feel so robbed of agency when I'm just standing around waiting for Jafar to sit still. You can technically manipulate which way Jafar flies by moving around the room in specific ways, but I'm never cognizant enough to attempt this, I'm always just living in the aftermath of failing the one cycle trick. All in all, the most important thing about this fight is that you want to keep Jafar above a platform and try to avoid using finishers on him, especially when he's floating in midair, since that automatically sends him into wispy ball mode. If that wasn't awful enough, this fight is followed by a battle against my least favorite collection of pixels in a video game, Genie Jafar. I'd say the trick to getting a faster fight here is easier to execute than plain Jafar, but the punishment if you fuck it up can be so, so much worse. As far as I've been able to learn, Iago can have two patterns in this fight, one of which he'll choose after you bully him in his corner once he flies in from your right. If you get the favorable pattern, it's a lot easier to deplete his HP before he flies out of reach. Even still, it requires fairly tight timing with your air combos, and he more often than not gets away from me. Sometimes he'll be out of reach, but Genie Jafar will dive up through the lava and meet me near the spot where I stopped being able to hit Iago, and sometimes he just won't and I'll be stuck, fruitlessly jumping on these big dumb blocks and unable to hit his pet bird. Or, sometimes Jafar is in range, but I'm just one MP unit short of being able to finish him off with blizzards. There is points in this fight where Iago can be 100% unreachable, and it is, again, so demoralizing, just watching those precious seconds tick away. Thankfully, if you're feeling really bad after the Jafar gauntlet, the optimal strat in the next part is to unalive Sora, which is easier to do when you're in a negative headspace. The carpet escape sequence can be shortened by taking the appropriate amount of debris and lava pillars to the face, saving you from playing the rest of the segment. Since we're on beginner and have certain stat boosters and equipment, it's way more difficult to die here than to live, so dying quickly on top of that actually requires strategy to pull off. And now HP balls are effectively hazards here, so logic is pretty much inside out for this part. Good news is that Monstro is fairly straightforward, which is somewhat ironic considering its reputation from most childhood or first-time playthroughs. 
There's apparently a really difficult trick you can pull off here to shorten your chamber diving experience, but you can keep that voodoo far away from me, I'll just stick to following the green glowy doors. If you're brand new to speedrunning the game but know about the green door thing, you can get to Parasite Cage within like 90 seconds of getting control of Sora in this world. After the last three or four bosses, Parasite Cage is pretty merciful, and it's not too hard to get a good fight against it if you know what to do. You can just do really low and fast air combos on him, and basically stunlock him for the entire battle, preventing him from ever getting an attack off. I consider no damage here to be perfect for my standards, and then taking one or two hits as pretty good. I would think most people could get a good fight here with relatively little practice. I'm not 100% certain on this, but your party members plus Riku might actually fuck up your rhythm and aggro the cage early, or they might have nothing to do with it, I'm really not sure. After that, it's more menuing, followed by a visit to Monstro's Throat. Not that it really matters, but I like getting rare truffles here because they're rare and they're very cute. I consider the run blessed if they show up. No truffs? So no truff? So no truffs? No truffs? Fuck. So no truffs? So no truff? So no truffs? Yo, truffles! Once we're, and I already really regret saying this, deep in Monstro's guts, the second Parasite Cage battle is, as far as I can tell, more of the same. You can stunlock him with a similar strategy to the first fight, and when he opens his mouth to show his big ball, you can keep him that way for longer by restraining yourself from doing combo finishers. Once we leave Monstro, we go back to Monstro so we can grab the crucial Water Gleam Summon Gem, which will let us call forth Dumbo later on. This also puts us closer on the map to our next destination, Halloween Town. If you didn't know or need a refresher, you only need to complete two out of three worlds between Monstro, Atlantica, and Halloween Town, and Atlantica is assuredly the slowest, so spooky time it is. I think Halloween Town is a pretty interesting part of the run. It definitely has some sore spots for me, but I got to learn some cool stuff for this world. Something of note early on is that it's important to grab this power up in Guillotine Square, which is the only stat booster you get in the run outside of the ones from Sora's Dream. It's business as usual for the next few minutes, going to the graveyard and partaking in the monster mash by blizzarding everything that moves. After delivering flowers to Dr. Fink, you need to head back through the graveyard to reach the Mayor's Tombstone minigame, and this time you might get white mushrooms as the spawn set. Apparently this is actually slower than getting the normal mob set, but not for me, because I suck. If you get regular Halloween Town mobs, there's this trick you can do where you hop on one of these pillars and then jump over the Search Ghost spawn trigger, but I've never gotten it right. If you do that, it's faster to get the hostile mobs, but I'm always happy to piss off the charades mushrooms and be on my way. Although we need to head back to the doctor again after getting the jack-in-the-box, it behooves us to move forward into Moonlight Hill so we can perform some maintenance on this fire-powered lift here. Since we have to pass through the graveyard again on our way to the manor, doing this now lets us take the lift back to the graveyard and it'll be waiting for us when we return. Then we yada yada through cutscenes until we're making said return trip. Since the color of the command menu is irrelevant when it comes to using the lift, we can just ignore whatever spawns we get on the third visit to the graveyard and do a jumping fire on the lift and fuck off out of there. This brings us back to the hill, and once again you can potentially get black fungus in this room. Just like in Agrabah, you're best off getting back on the lift and coming back in, even if it feels slower than fighting the shrooms. Ideally, you'll want white knights and gargoyles, which you want to bully with blizzard spells and keep them contained to this corner to avoid any more spawns. Now we finally get retribution for Waterfall Cavern, because up next is like the quintessential KH1 platforming moment, but turned up to 11. There's a specific route you can take to climb the manor incredibly quickly, it's called Community Climb, and it is ecstasy to pull it off. The good news is that it's way easier than it looks, and it looks intimidating. You're also not stuck in the thinnest room in gaming, so there's less fighting with the camera here. There's also less fighting with the Heartless, because you can bypass the usual combat at the door here and skip lighting the lift inside the first room by jumping on the exterior portions here. There are some somewhat tricky jumps, but this platforming sequence has a much higher success rate for me than the Deep Jungle one. Once we reach the top, we have to fight the Brats with a passion for fashion, and guess what, you just vomit out blizzards until you run out of MP. After that, aside from menuing, do not forget to flick the lever in the evil playroom, otherwise you can end up locked outside the Oogie door at the bottom of the manor, and the run is pretty much dead. Once in the torture chamber, the goal is to get Oogie killed in two cycles, aka two presses of the floor buttons. In between the presses, you need to try and deflect his dice, as well as launch jumping fire spells at Oogie. Even though it does chip damage, it can make the difference between two and three cycles. I also learned that Oogie knocking you back down to the roulette wheel is triggered by getting 10 hits on him, and that includes hits landed by party members. So you actually want to try and separate Donald and Goofy on the other side of the gate when you press the floor button so they don't steal your stronger hits and replace them with weaker ones. This is, of course, followed by the manor fight, which is extremely stressful. It's not all too different from what you do on a regular run, you're just way more anxious and cognizant of how finicky some of these ledges can be. 
Sora has a particular fixation on this one here, which has sent me into a panic several times. But I just try to work my way from bottom to top and cut corners on jumps whenever possible. Falling off is, of course, a big time loss, but it feels easier to recover from than any of the Jafar nonsense. Once Halloween Town wraps up, we're unfortunately headed for the biggest hunk of RNG bullshit that this run has to offer. It's also another big drawback to playing on console, because as far as I'm aware, if you play on PC, you're allowed to use a mod that circumvents this. Of course, I'm talking about Captain Hook's ship, which views attendance as entirely optional. Even though you only need to do two out of three worlds in this part of the map, there is a side effect to this corner cutting. That being the chance that Hook's ship will not show up to ambush you, instead allowing your gummy ship to continue its course uninterrupted toward Atlantica. I guess it's the game's way of suggesting that you complete every world, though there's no such random chance-based penalty for avoiding Olympus Coliseum. Regardless, for my purposes of beating the game quickly, it's a problem when the game refuses to show up. And there's just nothing you can do about it. Sometimes when you blast off, you'll run into Hook's ship, and sometimes you won't. And if it doesn't show up, you just try again. At my level, it isn't a run killer, you lose like 45 seconds each time you miss it, but that doesn't change the fact that it sucks how it's completely up to luck how this flight goes. On the bright side, if it happens during your PB, it's a free time save. And I've only ever missed it like twice in a row, so it could be a lot worse. Apparently the record is 7. No! Anyway, once we finally arrive on the ship, it's a beeline for Antisora. I picked up a few movement things, like skipping the slower ladder animation by just doing some jumps in the hold, and once again using fire to smoothly fall through this hole to the freezer. Anti-Sora is still kind of a big question mark for me. Prior to the fight, I replaced Blizzard with Stop on my shortcuts, which you can abuse during both the Anti-Sora and Hook fight. I had better luck using it on the ladder. I try to loop Anti-Sora by staggering my hits, and once that inevitably fails, I try to use Stop whenever I can to get some free hits on him, but his model is so low and slippery, it never tends to go great. Definitely one of my weakest fights, and something that can be demoralizing if he decides to be an intangible shadow for long stretches of time. Once he's down, it's time for the biggest chunk of menuing in the run. I could do this 50 times in a row with the menu guide, and if he asked me to do it without it for the 51st time, I couldn't tell you where to begin. This menuing segment even has you changing the party member AI, mainly so they can keep you stocked up on MP for the hook fight coming up. You also remove all of Peter Pan's abilities so he doesn't use MP and potentially take any attention away from you when it comes to restoring it. Then we just take a lap around the ship and make our way to the deck. Of course, before Hook, we have to deal with the mob fight beforehand, and this is Simba's first appearance in the run. I would actually use him here on a level 1 run as well, after getting some damage storage, though it was never enough to take out all the mobs. In this case, if you summon Simba right at the start of the fight and don't move, you can take out everything but the battleship at the end if you time the roars properly. Hook is a smoother fight than Anti-Sora for me, but still a bit tricky to get right, and I've only ever managed it a few times. Not including my PB, of course. But in a perfect world, you can cast Stomp on him from the get-go, and then keep him stuck by doing 4-hit combos, refreshing your Stomp, Rinse and Repeat. If you do it right, you can take him out before he gets a chance to do anything. Your lackeys will supply you enough MP to make this a viable strategy, so it's really just on you to time your combos properly. It's easier said than done, unfortunately, but the longer you keep up the Stomp lock, the better. After the hook fight, we attack the clock hands of Big Ben, which is thematically relevant given how we just abused the Stomp spell. Once the keyhole is sealed, it's crucial to pick up the green chest in the corner, as that contains a Flare G, which is an upgrade to our current engine gummy. You could put this on when flying to Hollow Bastion, but I put it on right after leaving Neverland, because I will forget otherwise. Fairy Harp also gets put on here, I don't actually know why, but I trust the experts. Probably for MP reasons, if I had to guess. In addition, we also throw on Guard, Glide, and Ars Arcanum. I'm pretty sure I only use Guard in the opposite armor fight, and maybe the Ansem 2 fight, but it's still worth putting on. Ours is going to come in clutch for a lot of stuff coming up, and Glide is kind of a given, but it's crucial for streamlining your path through the Gizmo Shop Bell in a few minutes. Speaking of, back in Traverse Town, it's also crucial to remember to park at Merlin's house and get Dumbo. Many times have I been on the way to Hollow Bastion and realized I forgot to revive my pet elephant. He is useless to us while trapped in a rock. Once he's restored, we warp back to the accessory shop and head to the second district. The goal is to get to the Gizmo Shop roof with as little enemy attention as possible. Ideally, you want to immediately jump onto the awning to your right, and then glide alongside these buildings, staying as close to them as you can. At the handbag store, there's this awful bastard of a jump, you have to pull yourself up onto the roof as far left as possible, I call it the Marxism jump. I'm probably exaggerating, but it feels like if you're so much as a pixel too far to the right, you'll trigger these red nocturnes on the roof. Which is bad, because we need a blue command menu to ring the bell over there, and these guys will linger if you don't kill them. If they show up, I do my best to recover by taking them out with Blizzard. Of course, I have to do this manually because I just replaced Blizzard with Stop. Sometimes I forget that fact and end up casting Stop on them, which is, like, the worst possible thing you can do. Regardless of what happens on this roof, we fly over to the Gizmo Shop, aiming between these pillars here. 
This next batch of prismatic melodies is unavoidable and needs to be killed so we can peacefully ring the bell. It seems like the best way to do this is by immediately using R's when you land, which typically does a good job at taking out most or all of the enemies. Breezing past the bell ringing and guard armor, we get Opposite Armor, who likes to take any good vibes or confidence you have in your run and turn them into the opposite of that. I thankfully haven't had too many bad run-ins with him, but he can be random after the start of the fight, which is obviously not ideal. But the fight always begins with him flinging his limbs at you, which you can guard and then follow up with an R's attack on one of his hands. But after that, I just sort of go nuts on the combos and don't really have an actual strategy. If I can replicate that guard into R's thing again, that's great, but if not, I just chase him down and no-brain attack him. But he sucks and is bad. Arriving in the Rising Falls, I learned that you can actually trigger the Beast and Riku cutscene much quicker by just rolling toward the underside of the Big Island instead of trying to platform your way up. Once we're abandoned, at some point between now and reaching the end of the waterway puzzle, I try to pre-select gravity on my magic drop-down menu. I don't have it in my shortcuts at this point in the run, nor do I really need it right now, but it is helpful for the defender at the end of the waterway. KH1 remembers where your cursor is on the magic menu even when you change rooms, so I try to prepare ahead of time when I have a free second. A combination of gravity and beast are what you need to kill the defender quickly. Of course, if you're mashing triangle to sick beast on him, you might accidentally whip out an R's, which is less than effective when channeled through a wooden sword, so be wary of that. On the way back to the castle gates, while it's possible to use beast and magic to kill the dark balls, it's way easier to throw yourself into this wall over and over until they pity you enough to despawn, allowing you to examine the crystal for the elevator back up. Next up is the Riku 1 fight, which is also still a weak spot for me. I'd much rather Riku 2, where I feel like I have something of an actual strategy. But here, I return to the time honor tradition of using R's and hoping for the best. And it's fitting because I don't even know how to do this fight while playing the game normally. He's an asshole. Once that's over with, we move on through the library and start the emblem door puzzle. Two things of note here. One, I'm usually pretty pleased with KH1 lock-on, but being under the stress of going fast while trying to target these candles to cast fire on sometimes has me feeling differently. Two, this statue is so fucking weird. Every single time I try to push it, Sora will give up partway through. At minimum, it takes two attempts for the push animation to actually play all the way through, but I've had it take four attempts before. It's janky in some spots, but its uh, I would still say it's polished, which maybe sounds like... contradictory, but... I... <sighs> <laughs> I think it might have to do with how close your party members are to you when you start pushing it, but I'm not sure. Okay, I lied. Three things of note, including this. It's the coolest thing I've ever done, and the coolest thing I'll ever do. Heading back outdoors, we have our final bit of gummy preparation to do, believe it or not. Even though it's somewhat out of the way, it helps us later on to grab the Haste 2 gummy on the other side of the castle gates. This is complicated by Wyvern spawning when you exit the lift stop. Ideally, you want to take this one out with fire and or gravity, and then glide over to the chest, but sometimes it can end up following you, which is obviously not preferable but we'll want to plop this Haste 2 on our ship for the return trip and our flight to End of the World later on. After the big elevator ride, we reach the only Trinity mark in the run that's actually worth doing, because it's like objectively the best Trinity reward in the game, giving you two cottages and a Mega Elixir, all of which we'll be putting to use. On top of that, it spits out MP balls, which can be good insurance for the upcoming Maleficent fight. Especially since we next need to spend three MP to summon Dumbo for my favorite trick in the run, and something I even used before speedrunning the game. I've definitely mentioned this in past videos before, but you can skip the whole block-moving puzzle with the crystals by summoning Dumbo here, flying as high as you can, and then dismissing to grab onto this ledge. There's a chance you'll be violated by a wyvern in the process, but thankfully this hasn't happened to me during a run. This means we head right to the Maleficent fight, which is actually pretty easy to get through quickly if you know what to do. I just get on the platform as soon as possible, do a couple of no-finisher combos, then throw out an R's, and repeat. The most important thing is to never do a finisher, since that'll make her turn intangible like Jafar. Of course, we have to do the dragon fight right after, which is basically just hook on four legs. Same general idea, casting stop, getting out as many hits as possible, and refreshing stop before it runs out, over and over. I always try to pop an elixir at some point during this fight, and if you do it right, you can also get through this without the dragon really doing anything. But I usually drop my combo at some point and have to pick her off with unstopped combos toward the end of her health bar. And there's no time to rest because Riku 2 is right after that. As I mentioned earlier, I much prefer this fight to the first one because I actually have some sort of idea on what to do here. Once again, Ars is the MVP, and the move is typically to stagger him and then let an Ars out and just do that at every opportunity you can until running out of MP. After that, I try to get him stuck in the same loop I used in the level 1 guide, which is like a 1, 2, 3, 4. If you do it right, he never escapes and thus never uses his very time-wasting DM. This is definitely one of the most satisfying tricks to pull off, especially considering what this fight put me through as a kid. Then we turn into a shadow, yada yada, we end up back in Traverse Town. After talking to Sid, I warp over to the Magician's Study so we can get to the secret waterway quicker, and I implore you to not accidentally decide to practice magic in the middle of the final stretch of the run. I've been there, it's not ideal. Merlin, help! 
No! I'm practicing magic. I'm practicing magic. I meant help me with like getting to the cavern, not with my magic. I also learned that you don't actually need to talk to Kairi before checking out the mural in the waterway. You can kind of just ignore her and walk past her. It's rude, but effective. Once the Navi G is installed, we gotta slap the Haste 2 gummy on that we got earlier and set course back for Hall of Bastion. The only real piece of gummy strategy that I have when flying an actual route crops up here, and that's quitting back to the world map after reaching a certain segment of the route. I didn't learn it until my second most recent PB, but after flying through the warp hole, there's three backgrounds that change the further you get into the route. Once it changes to the black and purple swirl, you can pause and hit select world, and for whatever reason, the game thinks you've completed the route and renews your access to Hall of Bastion. I don't understand it, but I'm not going to start asking questions now. Back at Rising Falls, we switch out Donald for Beast for something later, and we make our way back to the castle gates. This time around, we can actually use Dumbo Skip again on this archway and skip over going through the entrance hall and library, and by extension the unskippable Beast and Bell cutscene. The reason this isn't used on the first visit is because the game won't actually allow the elevator crystals to activate unless you've already completed the emblem door puzzle. However, to summon Dumbo, or anyone for that matter, you need a red command menu, so we have to intentionally get some Heartless to spawn, but ideally not too many. This has gone very poorly in the past. If I recall, during one of my PBs, a red nocturne sniped me up the asshole with a fire blast. Because a red nocturne is gonna snipe me up the asshole with a fire blast, and I'm gonna fall to base level, and I'm gonna cry. Oh! I didn't fall down to base level, but I probably should have gone there instead of running over to the entrance hall, but I panicked. If you do mess up the Dumbo skip, you have to leave combat and re-enter it, since you can't use the same summon twice in one combat session. Once we're back on the big elevator, there's a bit of menuing, and the part I want to point out is taking off Beast's ferocious lunge so he'll only use his other special ability, Furious Bellow. As far as I know, this is specifically for this elevator fight, where if you mash Triangle, there's a decent chance Beast starts the encounter with the Bellow and can take out a bunch of the mobs. From there, it's the normal route up to Castle Chapel again, once more using Dumbo Skip on this ledge. Our final Hollow Bastion boss is the Behemoth. If you can believe it, the only thing I do this fight is ours. I used to slog through this on my earlier attempts with just basic combos, and ours is obviously way faster. That's really all there is of note here in my experience. The Behemoth fight is followed by that infamous cutscene with the Final Fantasy crew that can't be skipped for some reason, which is legitimately a decent time for a bathroom break if you're as fast as peeing as you are at playing Gage 1. Alright, if I go now, and I mash X, let's see, let's just make sure. Whatever, we're going. We can skip that, we can skip that. Oh god! All right, I'll be back. Oh, thank God. Oh, thank God. <laughs> We're good. Oh, I feel so much better. Oh, God, I'm gonna play so much better now. Just make sure you wash your hands because the leaderboard moderators add a five minute penalty for lack of hygiene. With that, the Hollow Bastion part of the run is over, which means in my PB, I spent like half an hour there, including the third trip to Traverse Town. Which is kind of nuts since my run is at like an hour 40 when landing an HP for the first time, so it goes to show you spend a ton of time here. Finally, we're in the end of the world, and naturally this is a dangerous portion of the run as it's the only world in the game where I've died during my attempts. Our first challenges here are some mandatory mob fights against invisibles and then angel stars, and the typical answer against these guys is liberal use of the gravity spell. Just switch your lock on between targets and bust out the gravities like crazy. I also pick up this elixir right after the angel star fight because we're going to be drinking these like it's last call for the rest of the game. Typically, you would use one of those cottages you got from the Trinity right before this behemoth fight, but sometimes I use it early prior to Maleficent. It's definitely ideal to use it here instead, but it's not the end of the world if you don't. Well, I, I guess it technically is. Unlike the first behemoth, for this one, I keep up the trend of spamming gravity until I run out of MP. The cottage would ensure that Goofy would toss me a couple more bars with MP gift, which is obviously faster than finishing the behemoth off with regular combos. Up next is World Terminus, aka the Olympus and Atlantica rooms, because we never stepped foot or fin in them, let alone sealed their keyholes. These can be massive time wastes if you don't prepare properly. For Olympus, I learned that you want to summon Simba immediately, charge him for two flashes, and release before the air soldiers can kick you in the face, and then finish off the rest of the mobs with full charges. In Atlantica, the move is to launch fire at the sheltering zones and screw divers and gravities on the aqua tanks. It's super important to make sure the sheltering zones die from fire and not physical hits, as with the latter, they'll split into more C neons. It's even more important that you don't leave the room prematurely, aka before the white flash, otherwise the game doesn't acknowledge that you've cleared the mobs and you have to come back in and do it again. Speaking from experience, sadly. We'll take that. What the fuck? What? Did I leave too early? No way. 
Oh, no way. Oh, God, no way. Fuck me, no way. Then it's save point and mega elixir in the 100 acre wood room, gravity spam on the invisibles in the lab room, another elixir, and on to Chernabog. And here is the earliest point in the run where I've died. Specifically on my sober follow-up attempt from my initial drunk stream. But the key piece of advice here is to leaf bracer through the flame pillars. You're not going to be using magic on anything else anyway, and it's quicker to do that than to fly away and then back in. And obviously this also keeps your health full, so it's a win-win. Beyond that, I just smack him without finishers and ideally only get blown away by his wing attack once. Sort of similar to the pot centipede fight, after he's dead, if you descend to land on the volcano, the game should put you closer to the next loading zone once you regain control. There's actually something similar but a lot more difficult with the anti-Sora fight. If you like dodge roll into this door when the fight ends, the game might have a faster fade out, but I've never had it work. I do a bit of unorthodox menuing here, I think it's usually recommended to just put on super glide and one mega elixir, but I fill my item slots all the way up. Typically you do this at final rest, but I am so terrified of the Linked Worlds fight coming up that I want to make sure I have everything at my disposal. This fight is also scary on a level 1 run and also uses some similar strategies that I employ there. It starts off with another fucking behemoth for good measure, which as to be expected is defeated with ours. Or actually, maybe you're supposed to use gravity on this one too, I'm not sure. Once he's dead, you want to be hugging the wall before the mini cutscene of the emblem starts, because once it ends, the dark balls start spawning in. As soon as they're tangible, you'll want to launch fireballs into their faces, two apiece. Of course, you have to be cognizant of how much MP you're spending, because you'll need a ton for the upcoming gravity spam, and most importantly, summoning Simba. Once the dark balls are dealt with, a big group of invisibles spawn in, and this is pretty much the make or break point in the fight. Oprah is to free cars as Sora is to gravity, and once there's only a few or one invisible left, you really need to pay attention to your HUD and positioning for what comes next. I like to be right next to the emblem since we'll be heading that way when the fight ends, but most importantly because it's way the fuck away from everything else. Next, you need to make sure that you not only have enough MP to summon Simba, but that Donald and Goofy are alive since you can't summon without them. As soon as that last invisible dies, you gotta summon Simba and start charging immediately. As long as you don't lose your nerve thanks to an angel star flapping its gross little wings at you, you should be able to clear out the rest of the waves with full charges, ending the most stressful mob fight in the game. Alternatively, you can panic and summon Dumbo instead, just for a fun little story to tell your grandkids someday. Oh, cause Donald's dead! Fuck! And I picked Dumbo. Die, I guess. And at last, we arrive at the final gauntlet. Some last minute equipment and ability arranging, some mega elixir grabbing, and some door opening. Ansem 1 is our first fight here, and I learned that the most key aspect of this battle is keeping him cornered near the selfie dock. It's tempting to go behind him when the Guardian comes out to get more damage in, but that'll push him out into the open air, and that's bad. The last thing you want is him floating out of reach. Instead, I use ours when Terra shows up, which hits through him. If Ansem does escape his makeshift prison, I just work on hitting him back in that general direction. Once this fight is over, it's the last chance to menu, during which that other cottage can be used since you don't get a full heal for Dark Side 3 and Ansem 2. For Dark Side 3, the answer is Ars and Gun, aka Faraga Spam. Ars his hand, get a combo and a half on his head, air combo his hands again until the ball explodes, and then use your gun to launch Justice directly into his chest. Fire has a longer reach than you might think, and it lets you consistently deal damage to Dark Side even when he seems like he's too far away to reliably attack. If you're good enough, I know you can kill him before he even gets his hands out of combo range, but that ain't me. Next is the very, very bad man. This fight is pretty scary to me, and another spot where I can die if I'm not careful. For that reason, I play things safer than I probably need to, but losing here means doing the dark side fight again, so I'd rather not take my chances. On the other hand, I also try to be aggressive here and keep the pressure on him, since giving him room to breathe tends to prolong the fight. I tend to have an easier time deflecting his charging attack if I'm already up in his face doing air combos. But Submit is a massive threat here, and if I get hit with that, I tend to use ours to try and ride out the iframes for as long as possible, and use elixirs if I have any left to keep me alive. Ideally, you get through this fight without him doing the DM, kind of similar to the Riku 2 loop but with ours thrown in, but I've never managed to make it happen. Next is the first World of Chaos Ansem fight, which is another spot where I've died. Thankfully though, you don't have to do any previous fights again if you do. My strategy amounts to hitting X near Ansem's face. I also throw up arrow when the lasers start coming out and just tank the hits. That's it. I, I hate this fight. After that, it's the Shadow Core, to which I say Ars Arcanum. Then hit the dangly, sinewy thing and keep hitting it because you still get MP back even after depleting its HP to zero. That goes for really any boss in the game, like I always keep hitting Darkseid even after he's dead so I get a bit more MP for Ansem too. Next is the Artillery, which I also hate because I constantly clank off this fucking red piece of flesh but typically I try to arse them from behind and pick off the stragglers with combos. 
The Dark Ball core follows, which is just more fire like I did in Linked Worlds and using R's once they start to get close to me. Goofy's also here to hopefully gift some MP, which you might be low on after the artillery, unless you use an item afterwards, which you probably should. And then we have Face, and if you couldn't guess, I hate Face. Unless we're talking Face from Nick Jr., I want no part in it. Uh, I don't know, man. I put Arrow up and try to weave between the Thunderbolts and do three-hit combos, but I always fuck up the rhythm. Goofy can actually be pretty clutch here with his tornado attack, so I try my best to keep him alive so he can help with the damage output. The last enemy core is the Invisibles, which is the most visually terrifying, but it's important to keep your cool here. As soon as I get in here, I turn around and spam gravity at the spot behind me since that's where the Invisibles are going to charge towards. I do a couple more, and then naturally Ars Arcanum when they all clump on top of me. My current PB has the best Invisibles core I have ever and will ever get, I literally never get that lucky. Oh my god, no way! Then it's main core, which is just a few gravities and keystrokes, and with that, it's final Ansem time. And, uh, I wish I had some sort of relevatory knowledge to impart about this fight, but I do not. It's a complete clusterfuck in my eyes, I just try to keep up the arrow and stay close to him, avoid using finishers, and use whatever items I have left to keep the boys alive so they can help out. And that's it. Time stops when you land the final hit. So, that's my story, or at least my story so far. Including resets, it took me somewhere around 20 attempts to go from a drunk 3.5 hours to the top 100. And I'm just a YouTube content schmuck, so if I can do it, you can definitely do it. Assuming you want to subject yourself to the literal insanity that is speedrunning. Honestly, I entered a fugue state. I got the bug one day and it just didn't leave until I proved to myself that I could get the time that I wanted. It was a legitimate obsession for a while there. I might dust off the old timer and split someday and try again, but for now, I want you to get out there and give it a shot. I just need 10 of you to do it faster than I did so I get the itch again. Or maybe someday I'll run on PC instead of console to improve on my time there. Until then, I've got fond memories of the regular Pat speedrun arc, and I'm just glad I got to learn even more neat stuff about my favorite game of all time.